All right, excellent. Um, okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Um, this is um, supporting the mission and supporting the astronaut. Uh, and I said this to some of you a second ago that I put an opening reflection question here uh, where I'm asking you to think of a situation where you're so you're working uh, in some capacity and you're working alongside other people. Um, and in this situation, you're actually you're getting the job done. You're quite efficient, but at the same time, it's just really enjoyable for you to to be in that situation to be doing that. So I'm asking, and this is um, mostly a reflection question for you. You're welcome to to share in the chat. What is it that makes this really enjoyable to you? Because um, that balance between being efficient, between getting the job done, getting the job done, and at the same time uh, enjoying yourself is um, is uh, part of what I'm talking about today. So yeah, and so that's the title. It's supporting the mission and supporting the astronaut. And the longer title is how communication between crew in space and mission control on Earth combines operational efficiency with kindness and subtle humor. Yeah. Um, and my goals today, so I have two goals uh, with um, with with the with this one hour we have together, uh, the first is to give you a better understanding of how communication between astronauts in space and mission controllers on Earth actually works. I mean, some of you may know this really well already, but for others, uh, that's sort of my first purpose to give you an idea about how does this actually work. Uh, and the second one is for you to gain some insight into how we can, again, combine operational efficiency with kindness and with this subtle humor and communication. And so this can both be if you are an actual astronaut or if you're a flight controller or, you know, because most of us do have earthbound jobs. Um, this is uh, I'm, I'm also trying to to uh, target uh, the rest of us in, in that sense. And we have an hour in total, and I hope I'll have time at the end for questions. That's uh, at least what I've planned for. Yes. So um, who's talking? Who am I? So my name is Dennis Jim Fredrickson, um, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Communication and Psychology at Aalborg University in Denmark. Uh, I come from a communication background. That's where I have my master's degree from in 2009. I have a PhD that's now three years old. Um, uh, and I work at Aalborg University, and I've done that since 2010. Um, and I'm doing research and teaching there. And broadly, so some of it is space based, but broadly, it's uh, somewhere in the cross section between interpersonal communication. So communication between people, uh, usually face to face, um, but not in the case of space, actually. But so that type of human connection and, and how we actually communicate and, and deal with each other. Um, and that always considered in terms of what kind of relationships, what kind of organizations, what kind of contexts does this happen in and space and space travel human space flight is one very particular context uh, for this area but that's broadly what I'm, I'm working with so that's me I'm also quite curious I think especially coming from a communication background it was difficult to me for me to figure out who's my target audience here who actually attends this type of event so I hope you'll help me to get just a little bit acquainted so if you want to please write in the chat so one is, where are you in the world right now? And secondly, is there a particular role you have that brought you here? So are you a student or you're a space professional, a space enthusiast? Are you just curious or what could it be? Just to give me an idea about um, who we are, that would be um, helpful. And also just help my curiosity, uh, quite honestly. So thank you. Um, yes, so that's um those those are the opening words um and that brings us to this background area and for some of you this is going to be i think common knowledge but um i wanted to make sure that we were just uh, on the same page for for some of the basics um so the type of space to ground communication the type of communication between astronauts and people on the ground that i'm working with and i'm doing research on is between iss the international space station and people on the ground that are, are helping that. Uh, so I ju just want to give you the quick uh, intro to that in case you don't know, or in case we have different ideas about what we're talking about. Um, so this is the ISS, the International Space Station. It's flying around Earth right now. Um, 
And astronauts will usually live around six months at a time up there and work up there. Um, we've had astronauts on board the ISS since uh, year 2000. So that actually means that for 22 years and a bit more soon, we've actually had uninterrupted human presence in space. Uh, I always find that a bit fascinating. Um, another sort of uh, practical fact, if you will, is that it's flying around only 400 kilometers over the surface of Earth. So it's not that far away. And it's going uh, at a 28,000 kilometers an hour. Um, and one final sort of um, practical thing is that you can actually see it in the sky at night. And if you've never tried this, I can really recommend it. It looks like a really fast moving star, uh, but you can see it and you can stand down here on Earth and actually know that, OK, there are human beings flying out there that we've put out there and they're able to live and, and work in, in that tiny, uh, shiny dot. Um, that I always found that, find that really fascinating. So that's the ISS. And if we're moving a bit closer into what I'm going to talk about, the ISS is in many ways an extremely complicated piece of machinery, and it's flying in a really dangerous environment. And I think what was surprising to me actually moving in from just being interested in space and then to digging my way further into it was that Astronauts aren't really experts in many of the onboard systems um, on board the space station. Uh, so they really rely on a really large group of experts that are on the ground. Usually these are called flight controllers. Um, some astronauts even refer to themselves as glorified lab technicians or glorified maintenance workers. I think so it's a joke uh, in one sense, but I think it also holds some truth in the sense that they have to call the ground to ask if something is not working because there are subject matter experts down there that uh, do the heavy, heavy lifting in terms of figuring out what the problem is and then um, help them solve it. So that's sort of a, a basis for, for having space to ground communication. Um, and one one of the places this takes place, I'm just going to move myself, is here. This is a picture from Mission Control at NASA in Houston. There are several of these mission control centers uh, around the globe because different space agencies uh, are involved with, with the ISS. And what you can see here are different desks, different areas. So these people all have a different, different part of uh, maintaining the station and the systems on the station that they are in charge of. And that means if an astronaut has a problem, they can call the ground and then it's someone's job in this room or in another room to find the answer um, and, and figure out what the problem is and fix it. Specifically for space to ground communication, there's one person in this room, The uh, it's called the Capcom at NASA, but it's the spacecraft communicator. So there's one person who has the job of actually verbally communicating with the astronaut, um, in this case, the person over here. But that's the one we're looking at. So when we're talking about space to ground communication. This is the person that the astronauts are actually talking to. Um, and another schematic here. So that means I'm just going to go over here. Let's see. All right. So over here, we have the International Space Station. We have astronauts on board the International Space Station. And so if we go like this, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about with space to ground communication is these people talking together as one part of mission control. There's a spacecraft communicator and on board ISS, there are astronauts. So that's your big picture uh, of the situation I'm uh, we're, we're dealing with here. Now, as I said before, so the ISS is this really extremely complicated piece of machinery, uh, and it is flying in this really dangerous environment. Um, and at the same time, it's really expensive to operate the ISS. Um, and for, for, for many reasons, that also means that astronaut time is a pretty scarce resource. So it's uh, one priority for running the ISS is to be really efficient in solving problems and to get com tasks completed really efficiently and really quickly. And that has implications for the communication or for how communication uh, happens between the ground and between uh, between the ground and between the astronauts up there. So one ideal for space to ground communication is to be, as I've put up here, Clear, specific, and efficient. So it has to be quite clear what we're talking about because uh, it's a very complex place they're working and they have to um, spend their time quite efficiently, basically. Um, and I tried to make an example here. So if you can imagine that you're an astronaut working on this uh, express rack here, uh, that's part of the ISS. Um, what you cannot do, uh, this is of course a bit um, 
simplified perhaps, but you, you can't do, so uh, am I supposed to move that red to be like thingy down to one of those connectors down there at the bottom right of this thing? Um, that, that could cause problems because there are a lot of tubes here and a lot of connectors. So instead, a typical way for sort of the operational side of space to ground communication to work is that they'll say something like this. So they'll refer to a written procedure they have in front of them. Um, in step two decimal six of the proxy procedure, please confirm that the expected serial number for the connector I'm moving is 1035 and that the location it's going to is and so on and so on. So it's a very specific form of communication where you, you use a specific term. If, if, uh, if you're talking about a connector, about a tube, that tube is gonna have a number and you're gonna use that number. And if you're talking about a written procedure you're following, you're going to be specific about where am I in the procedure? What is it I'm reading right now? Um, and that all, I mean, that has to do with safety, but it also has to do with efficiency and actually um, getting things done um, in, a, in an orderly and timely manner, if you will. Um, so uh, one, for, one final way of explaining that is um, I tried explaining it like this to my colleagues that you can consider space to ground communication so it has to be really clear precise and efficient like really high level IT support where they're just really quick about getting the problem solved and they're really specific in what you need to do to get it fixed so it gets the job done in that sense um, but if you go back to my title for the talk so the title was supporting the mission and supporting the astronaut so supporting the mission, that's one way this is done by training astronauts and spacecraft communicators to be uh, clear, precise, efficient, uh, and so on. Uh, but there's a second title here, second part of the title, and that is supporting the astronaut. So what about this second part then? Uh, and that's where I'd like to go with, with my presentation to also address that part of it. Um, and to do that, I wanna talk just a little bit about communication theory. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly uh, standard model that some of you might be familiar with, uh, a model of communication that makes the distinction between uh, the content uh, of communication and what well, the content dimension and the relational dimension of communication. So we'll do it a bit step by step. So over here, just gonna go over here, you have two people talking, person A, person B, they're having a conversation. And when they're talking, when they're communicating, um, they are talking about something. So up here, you see there's a subject. Uh, they're talking about something. Um, but at the same time, there's an interpersonal relation between them. So these people um, in the astronaut panel, uh, one of the astronauts was talking about perspectives and about uh, that how we can have different perspectives on, on things as human beings. And so that is here. That's the subject relation. So the person's... Um, perspective on the subject they're talking about. But at the same time, uh, whenever we have a conversation right now, so this is a very one-sided conversation. I'm at least doing most of the, the verbal uh, talking here, but there's it actually takes place in an interpersonal relationship relationship between, between us. Ah, there are words here. Um, yeah. And that model um, has implications for um, talking about space to ground communication. So if we move on a bit, um, yeah, so it's the same here. These two are having a conversation about something and there's a certain relationship between them. We could argue here, we could guess that it, it's it's a warm, uh, um, caring relationship perhaps just based on what we're seeing. And that could have implications for the way they talk about what they're talking about. And also the other way around that the way we talk about things also has implications for what kind of relationship we have uh, with other people. Um, yeah, the same here, uh, different people, but it, this is the same model, uh, the, the same basic idea. So if we translate that into, again, I have to move space to ground communication, same model as before. Yes, the same will happen here. Um, and then we can add the, uh, the, the aspects we had from before. So if we're talking about the subject, we have this ideal of being clear, being concise, and being operationally relevant. That's another way of, of saying what I was addressing before. Um, but there's also a relational aspect to be considered. Um, as, so if you were here for, for Anahita's talk, 
uh, one of the things you were talking about, Anissa, was also about the need for feeling human connection, the need for for things that uh, don't only uh, have to that don't that that not only have to do with getting the job done or or surviving, but I mean living uh, in a sense. And one of those things that you can also do through communication is support astronauts' well-being and also support the working relationship between crew and mission control on the ground, so that that uh, keeps being um, being useful. Um, and so, for instance, and that's what I've uh, studied in my research on space to ground communication. What happens down here in this interpersonal relational area is that humor and kindness and warmth and this feeling of human connection is also part of space to ground communication, in addition to being really specific and, and trying to be quite efficient as well. So, and one of the questions that I have then um, that I'll now share with you is so okay, if we have these ideals of being really clear, really specific, and really efficient, couldn't that also come at the cost of feeling kindness, of feeling warmth, of feeling that human connection that we also um, need as human beings? Um, and another way of saying that is that, so if we have the operational ideals over here of being clear, of being specific, of being efficient, um, what if we, I mean, there could be a, a backside of that coin. So clear communication could run the risk of being sterile. Specific communication could run the risk of being rigidly kept as short as humanly possible because I need to, to get things moving. And if you're communicating solely with the purpose of being really efficient, it could also run the risk of turning almost cold. Uh, and you can play around with that and you know, use other words, but... Um, I thought that was a nice, it, it, it sort of shows um, the potential backside of, of uh, following those ideals if you're only following them. Um, so, and that brings us to this point. So for astronauts, for flight controllers, for the people on the ground that are, are communicating with, with the astronauts, there could be a problem here, potentially on paper, but there doesn't seem to be a problem here, uh, interestingly, um, from what I found um, when I was studying um, studying this. So what I've done is I've looked at how, um, uh, what's it called? I've um, transcribed a lot of the actual radio communication that goes on between uh, English-speaking astronauts on the ISS um, and English-speaking uh, flight controllers on the ground. I don't speak Russian, so I had that was sort of my my stopgap there. Um, and what I found was that uh, astronauts and spacecraft spacecraft communicators they even quite elegantly combine this operational efficiency with kindness and with subtle humor. What I've tried to do, and there are references at the end of, of the slides, is to develop a terminology to describe this. So I'm talking about operational wit or being, you know, being witty. Uh, so they have subtle humor and other sort of imaginative uses of language built into this otherwise operational communication. And I also found what I've called operational kindness. So they're combining, again, being operational, being uh, um, efficient and clear with uh, being helpful, with showing appreciation, with showing an understanding of other people's perspectives. Um, and so there's a quite nice balance there that I'm going to try to to show you how, um, at least one example of how they're, how they're doing. And that example comes here. So... Um, and this is where um, things might get a little technical. I'm going to show you a transcription, and then I'm going to try to do just a little bit of, of actual conversation analysis uh, uh, live with you guys um, to give you an idea about in some detail what it is um, that I found that they were doing. So let's have a look. Um, first, I'm just going to read out loud what happens in this little interaction. This is uh, Chris. He's an astronaut on board the ISS, and Allison is sitting in mission control uh, in Houston. So I'm just going to run through it first and tell you what they're saying. Uh, read it out loud. And then afterwards, um, I'll say a little bit more about it. So this starts by Chris saying, Houston station on two for SSC 22. That's how he starts. Allison responds, go for SSE 22. So she's saying she's ready to listen now. 
So Chris says, good morning, Allison, or good afternoon, or uh, good morning. I know that you guys have probably got handover from the last shift that we were having issues with SSC 22. SSC 22 is a laptop, it's a computer. Um, and since then we've done a reboot and a reboot with a battery removal and a reboot with a battery removal and a hard drive, hard drive removal, and I have locked back in. It's still giving us the same issues. I just want to give you the update that we've done those additional steps. You're welcome to come on board at any time. I know that Pluto is working on a lot of things this morning. And Pluto isn't a person. That's the name of one of the positions, one of the area of ex areas of expertise in mission control. So that's what Chris says. Allison uh, in mission control uh, replies. Thanks, Chris. It's good to talk to you. We appreciate the update and Pluto is definitely working on a lot of things and has put that on their to-do list. Chris answers, okay, copy. I just wanted to let them know that we've done those additional steps of the different, uh, all the reboots that we're capable of doing. So just wanted to add that. So take the time. We appreciate all the hard work on the weekend. Allison finally replies, and we appreciate your troubleshooting as well. Thanks, Chris. So that's the conversation. Uh, and from uh, the, the observation data I have, it's quite typical of, um, of what we're seeing in space to ground communication. So um, if we now sort of dive into this conversation, I'm gonna try and, and give you a little analytical insight into uh, where I'm finding operational kindness, where I'm finding that it's not just operational, but it's also uh, relationally uh, um, uh, kind, um, yeah, for lack of a better word. So the first thing um, we see here that Chris is using Allison's first name without her having identified herself. He So Allison just says, go for SSC 22. Uh, and then Chris says, good morning, Allison. So he's demonstrating familiarity. He's actually showing that he knows her well enough to greet her by her first name without her actually having identified herself because they can't see each other. So likely he, he's able to recognize her by voice alone. Secondly, um, Chris greets her, and I put finally here because he's, he's changing his mind a bit back and forth. Uh, with good morning. So he's going, good morning, Allison, or good afternoon, uh, good morning. And I think that's a little gesture in that he's showing that he knows what the time is where she's placed in Houston, uh, because that's actually five hours behind the, the time zone that they're keeping on the ISS. So I think what's happening is that he's doing the math in his head up here, uh, figuring out, okay, what, what must the time be where you're at right now? And in that sense, and it's a, it's a Tiny gesture, but he's showing an understanding of, of a little aspect of Allison's situation uh, in, in that sense. Next, um, Chris says, I know that you guys have probably got handover from the last shift. So he's demonstrating that he understands how mission control does handovers between shifts. So he's showing an understanding. He's showing an understanding of a different perspective than one he has uh, here of how things are actually work in mission control. Uh, and then um, a little further down, uh, Chris said, I know that Pluto is working on a lot of things this morning. And also here, he's demonstrating an understanding of the working conditions of people in mission control. So he understands if this is going to take a while, basically. Um, and he's even at the bottom, he's mainly communicating about that he's not trying to be pushy. He really just wanted to offer information about the extra steps they did to try and troubleshoot the problem on station. Uh, so that it was available when the Pluto staff had time for it. Yeah. And finally, um, we finish off by both parts expressing appreciation towards each other. So Chris, we appreciate all the hard work on the weekend and Allison reciprocating, and we appreciate your troubleshooting as well. Thanks, Chris. Yes. So that's an example. So in between where you can see, he's actually talking quite specifically about the, the steps they've done, the, the number of reboots they did, and specifically uh, how they pulled it, took the battery out, how they took the hard drive out and, and put it back in. But there are also all these other uh, pleasantries and, and uh, acts of kindness, if you will, um, built into this communication. Yes. So let me just have a look at time. Ooh. This is great. So I did bonus slides, and I'm just going to fast forward a bit. I just had a look at the had a look at the time. I can actually fit this in. 
So that's the first example um, of space to ground communication. And I have a different example that's I'm, I'm going to present it in a different way to you guys as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, let's just go get into it. This is example two. So the context for this is that an astronaut has called the ground before the little snippet I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, because they're having problems with a computer after having started a data collection tool. So basically, the computer started crashing after they opened this tool. They opened a piece of software on the computer. Um, so after the, the initial part of that conversation is that they establish a common understanding of the problem. And then the spacecraft communicator in mission control finishes um, his turn with saying the following. That's what I'll show you here. He says, I've fought many wars with the data collection tools, so uh, copy that one. And then he has this slight laughter uh, afterwards. Um, and so operationally, he didn't actually have to say this. Uh, I mean, there's no particular operational value from my perspective in saying that. He has the information he needs to start troubleshooting, but he adds that he's fought many wars with the data collection tools. Um, and I think what he's doing is that he's talking about the problem in, so I've written here, a stylistically playful way. So it's a subtle creative language use. He's talking about it as a war. It's not an actual war. It's a metaphor. We understand that. Um, and he's also talking about it as something to laugh a bit about. And what I want to show you here is that, so that's a choice. You could have expressed the same uh, uh, thing in different ways. If we go one way towards the more operational over here, the more operational, the more neutral area, uh, he could have said, uh, it has been my experience in the past that data collection tools can cause problems. So this is familiar to me. And so this is a less playful, there's no war metaphor, uh, there's no slight laughter. He's just expressing in a more neutral way that, okay, he recognizes the problem. Going even further out, out here, he could have just said nothing. He has the information he needs um, for, for um, his colleagues in, in mission control to start uh, working the problem. Um, but the risk here is that any possible frustration or the reaction from the astronauts would then just be left unmentioned. So that would only be uh, content and no relational component. Um, so on the other side of this, so that's sort of, that was the operational neutral side. Um, we could also say, okay, what about if we consider talking more towards this frustration or, or sympathy? So instead of saying, I thought many worse with the data collection tools, so copy that one, he could have said, ah, sorry to hear this is causing problems again, or going in even further, Oh, I'm so very sorry to hear that. We've had so many problems with DCT software. That must be really frustrating for you. So the first one here, I just put, so he's expressing sympathy. I'm sorry to hear this is causing problems again. With the second one here, um, he's expressing, well, okay, more sympathy. It's, it's, it's longer. It's more forceful in a sense. And I would argue, and I'm going to show you, show that in a second, that, so that moves the conversation between potentially being more about how this uh, can be frustrating than being about also maintaining that uh, operational balance we had over here. So um, the question is then, okay, how does this actually combine operational efficiency with kindness and humor, space to ground communication? Um, and what I found is that it maintains a balance. So it, with, when you're staying here in the middle, this is kind of the sweet spot for space to ground communication if you want to be both operational and you want to be supportive. Um, so you're neither ignoring or overemphasizing this potential frustration there could be in this case with a computer crashing. And I have a communication counterpart to this. Now we need to go back a bit because I didn't actually think I would have time. Here we go. So from a communication theory perspective, one way to explain this has to do with coherence or something called adjacency pairs. So a way that a lot of our verbal communication works is that it takes place in pairs that follow I've put certain conventions for politeness and preference. So basic examples here that if um, questions will tend to lead to answers. So if one person asks a question, that basically asks the other person to answer. I mean, we all know this. Um, the same that 
um, a greeting from one person requires the receiver to greet them back, or at least to account for why they did not do that. I mean, th those are, um, so Brown and Levison uh, um, described these as, as uh, politeness uh, criteria. Um, and the same goes for invitation, uh, which um, leans itself towards acceptance from the other part. If we translate that into, again, space to ground communication and uh, these uh, cases of humor and of kindness that I found, uh, it also shows um, what I was getting to before with the table. So um, if someone pays another person a compliment, um, if that compliment becomes a big enough part of the conversation, then uh, by politeness, the other person is required to somehow acknowledge and possibly reciprocate that compliment. And the same can uh, be said down here. We're talking about jokes or the use of humor in some way. Um, so laughter and other forms of recognition um, might be required. If, if I'm making a joke and I'm making a big enough deal out of making a joke, um, Brown and Levison would argue that then you guys would be required to show, okay, ha, 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 yes, yes, you are kind of funny, Dennis, I mean, regardless of if you really like the joke or not, um, if you wanted to maintain a certain level of politeness in the conversation. So, of course, this is uh, this will vary from context to context, but the, the point that I think is interesting is that um, if they made compliments or showed appreciation or, or expressed frustration or sympathy, if they do that um, in, in a too high degree, in a sense, that sort of forces the conversation to move towards talking about that um, and, and steers it away from, um, from being also operationally relevant. Um, and I've tried to, I was looking for a metaphor and a way of explaining this. Uh, and, and what I came up with was uh, the damned if you do and damned if you don't problem in space to ground communication. So if you are faced with a person, an astronaut or a flight controller that is um, making a joke or, or sharing a compliment and is making a fairly big deal out of doing so, uh, as the person responding, you have the choice of following what I've called the polite route here or not. But metaphorically, regardless of what you do, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So I'll explain. Um, so let's say you're given a very big and very elaborate compliment. If you do acknowledge this, uh, you risk losing operational value because the conversation can sort of turn over into becoming about exchanging compliments and pleasantries and, and lose that uh, uh, more operational value it also has. On the other hand, if you don't acknowledge, for instance, a big compliment, you can lose relational value. So, uh, you could do that if you wanted to sort of, okay, I, I want to steer this conversation back to an operational uh, uh, area as well, but that can come at a cost of being seen as impolite. And it, this could have consequences for your working relationship going forward. Um, so in that sense, um, once that first uh, um, ball has been served in the conversation that someone gave you a really big compliment, uh, you're kind of stuck uh, in, in, uh, in the politeness theory sense. So uh, moving towards the end here. Um, so if all, so what does it mean? All right, if we want to balance operational content with relational support. So if all space to ground communication was kept rigidly as short and as specific as possible, it would risk becoming really stale and sterile form of human interaction. So that's my first uh, point. And secondly, that these relational supportive aspects, they have the potential for creating a certain intimacy and social bonds, um, but they have to be subtle. Uh, so both parties have to recognize, or all parties, that it's there, but they shouldn't let it be like fully take over the focus on the conversation. And that's what I found. I showed you one example, but that's what happens in the space to ground communication that I studied. It's balanced all the time. So um, sometimes it's also just strictly operational, but when there are uh, these elements of wit, of humor and of kindness, it, 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 it's always intertwined with the operational content that, um, that they're, they're working on, that, that the, the reason the conversation started in the first place. Yes, so how are we on time? Oh, that was quick. That actually, um, I think I'm just gonna jump out of here and ask if you have any questions or comments.
So there are a few in the chat. Um, Nick Nilsson, given that the astronaut pool is so small in comparison to the general population, we would expect this kind of effective communication to be the norm among the high functioning astronaut class. But what about the mass of people? How can they be given the help they need to achieve similar standards of communication? When you only hang out with very mm. high functioning people, you come to think of this as the norm, but it's not. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, hmm. Well, I think, I think it's like that as it is with any other ideal or, or so there are lots of ideals about how we should communicate with each other uh, out there that, um, well, I'm, actually, I think I'll start with the small anecdote at, of that if you're, um, as me, working with communication professionally, people tend to uh, expect that I will communicate per perfectly, which is not how that works at all. Uh, but I know some of the ideas and then I can try to work my way towards them. But I think, okay, so astronauts are certainly uh, um, a particular or type of people, but I think it's also just from training. Uh, so if you really wanted to train your way towards doing this type of uh, communication of being really specific and really to the point, you could do that. Um, I was thinking about it's also just practical things like, I don't know if any of you know the feeling of writing an email where you know the way you write this, you're going to get two answer, two questions back because you didn't like you didn't cover all the bases. You didn't actually add all the information that you probably should have done um, if you wanted to give people the full picture of what they're asking, uh, but maybe you're busy or something else. But I think they've been trained to do that quite specifically, to think ahead. Uh, of course, also from context, they have loss of signal periods. Um, they're quite busy uh, in many ways. So um, yeah, there, there are contextual factors that help with that. But it doesn't mean that the rest of us can't also do that. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you think augmented reality tools will change communication with astronauts? It may be more efficient in terms of giving instructions, content communication, but remove some of the personal aspects. Hmm. That's a good, I wonder what you're thinking about with augmented reality tools. I mean, what type? Um, could you elaborate? You're welcome also to just do that verbally. Uh, uh, Saba, if you can hear this, do you want to? Um... Sorry, cannot mute, right. All right. Um, uh, let me see if I can, maybe while she's um, putting it in the chat, I have a question, Dennis, just so right. you, uh, Saba clarifies on that. Um, uh, what about the delay in communication with longer term, uh, longer distance missions? And are there any techniques if that delay isn't um, fixed uh, in some way? Uh, are there any techniques that they're going to be using to, to override that delay? I mean, it's a good question. I mean, they'll definitely have to change things because um, what they're doing today is also, uh, it's based quite a bit on the back and forth that we have right now, that we are able to respond to each other uh, almost immediately and add a little uh, comment here and there. Um, so yeah, if you think about the example I showed you guys with Chris, I think he's realizing that when he's giving that extra information, he could be understood as impatient. He's realizing that. That's why he's meta communicating about, I didn't mean to push or anything. Um, he wouldn't be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, so say we have a 11 or 15 minute delay. Um, it would have to be like recording a video message recording an online lecture, uh, getting a presentation with no audience, uh, mm -hmm. and just having to think about who, who am I talking to, what kind of information are they going to need? Uh, mm -hmm. And then you get feedback much, much later uh, about um, how that went, um, how they responded. Um, yeah, but it's a good question also because a lot of what I think this warmth, this connection that I'm arguing is there um, is also, I think it's something they sort of create together. Um, so if I have the sense I'm in a conversation with someone else, I, I mean, my my sense of what kind of relationship we have is also based on nonverbal cues uh, of, of how, how how's the voice sounding, is how familiar am I with this person already, et cetera. Um, and the, 
we don't have those cues if it's uh, uh, with that big of a delay, uh, or at least not in the same way. So some things will have to change. Um, I heard one study arguing that it's going to be a lot more written communication, uh, mm -hmm. which I think would cause the same problems, that it doesn't give that same human connection. We can emulate some of this, certainly. I mean, we know that from messaging services, et cetera, um, that we're writing in certain ways to show how you should understand the thing I just said. I mean, smileys uh, as a very basic example of that. Uh, but I think it's going to be different. Um, and yeah. just to, I, I'll quickly finish so you can get on, back onto Saba's question. But um, th that's why AI, if the deep space network is effective on longer duration missions, then that's where AI can be very um, important, at least for communication, direct communication without the delay. Um, with uh, artificial intelligence. So similar to Alexa in, in some ways, we're a bit more advanced, but I'm thinking of the diary room, you know, in the Big Brother where someone yeah, can yeah, go yeah. in and actually have, you know, direct communication with someone outside of the team potentially, but it's yeah. at least something that has, you know, immediate response um, to some degree. But I don't know if that's possible, but so I think- no, it's a good point. I mean, a very basic version of that, Jack Stuster did a diary study on ISS published in 2019, which they were just writing, astronauts were just writing diary entries. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of them actually commented on how that was quite helpful as a venting space. Uh, and also I think as a reflection room, I mean, um, yeah. But I mean, you could definitely do a more advanced version of that um, mm -hmm. with, with AI. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think there's more expansion on the question of the original question. All right. Uh, let's see. I meant, for example, using AR headsets to show steps, like, oh yeah, like the example we showed earlier, instead of telling the astronaut to do A, B, and C and check serial number. You can show them visually what tasks to carry out. Um, yes. So if it's just, I mean, <laughs> I, I think I can only agree, Sama, that if if the person is taking out of that, if it's a... Uh, if you have a piece of machinery that that is really good at giving specific instructions, you don't need uh, a, a human being uh, there to clear out misunderstandings or or to um, uh, um, to convey verbally what it is they need to do. Um, yeah, so I mean, there's a point there. I mean, if you get really good at doing AR headsets. Uh, and can quite quickly and seamlessly uh, send up new steps through those. Um, I mean, that poses another challenge for maintaining that human connection uh, that we're also going to need. Um, yeah, it's a good point, actually. Yes. I'm just reading. That's what you said as well, Saba. Yeah. <laughs> and it's removing the personal communication. So, Nick, some business psychologists advocate the use of humor in communication to break the ice. You talked today often highlighted use of humor. But humor has a political, political dimension that can alienate those who do not share your ideology. Other than selecting for ideological conformity or keeping all communication purely... Whoa, I don't know how to pronounce that. What, what does that mean? <laughs> So I'm a Dane. I'm, uh, this is my second language. Um, but okay. So what can address the opportunity and That's danger of communication present in human milk toast? Oh, so a like, timid or feeble person, feeble, inspired, or bland. Ah, it's Manila. I have okay. to do. Yeah, I got, I got to do you. Got you. Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's not particularly. Again, the humor I've seen is quite. I mean. So the the example I gave here was quite typical. I fought many wars with the data collection tool. He's just making a little joke about that. This is a tool that keeps coming back, giving them problems. Um, so it's not very, it's directed towards a piece of software, basically. I mean, so uh, I think that's what they're doing or also joking about themselves. Uh, another astronaut is... Um, speculating about what caused the problem to uh, to occur. And then he says at the end that, uh, so maybe that's what ha that's the problem, or maybe I've just uh, guaranteed that we'll have a new problem. So he's making like a karma joke, but it's about himself. He's saying that because I said this, he doesn't mean that obviously, but because I said this, maybe the problem will reoccur now. Uh, so I think there are ways around that, but it's definitely something I would be aware of. Uh, also in terms of if you're going to train towards doing this um yeah, <laughs> yeah Nick's just clarified yeah. what he meant um so um that's that's fascinating Dennis let's see what other questions um th there are um 
Andy is asking, has space communication style grown out of aviation communications? Early astronauts were mostly military pilots. Did their radio style just carried over? I don't know specifically, but as far as I know, that's the case. Um, I know that as I did a tiny field study in 2015 at the European Astronaut Center, and they were still trained in what I learned when I uh, served in the uh, Danish Emergency Management Agency. So like going to the military, basically, some Danes have to do that is think, press, speak for radio communication. First think what you're going to say, then press the button and then speak. So it was still basic things like that. Also, the way they start their conversation, Houston Station on tour for SSC 22. Um, I mean, that's that's a very particular way of starting your conversation. Um, I'm saying, uh, who am I calling? Where am I? Where am I? Which radio channel am I calling on? And what is it about? So there are certain uh, conventions here that I think comes out of, of that um, tradition. Um, yeah. But for the day-to-day -day work, because they're up there that long, it's much less um, only technical exchange of information. Um, yeah. Um, OK, I'm browsing back up now. How are we on time? Uh, so I think uh, 7.30 uh, UK time, so 8.30 your time, Dennis, is when the next session should start. Should start. OK, so we're OK. That's it. We're running out of time then. OK, I have one thing left then. Mm -hmm. If you will oblige me, uh, because I have this is my first time at the Space Education Summit. Um, so if you would spend just four minutes. I made a tiny evaluation, but it's just, it's a little different for me talking here than it is um, addressing my students because I know them as a target group. So in the chat now, I just put a link. Um, if you want, if you want to, that would be quite helpful to me. Uh, just click that and it's just three questions I think I ended up doing. Um, yeah, so thank you so much. Um, and I hope um, this was interesting to you guys. Um, yeah, but let's Thank see. you, Dan Dennis. It was fascinating. I saw this um, a version of this talk where you've added um, different layers to it today at the IAC, and um, which is why I, I and uh, Mark and Ron invited you and Gatita, Gatika invited you back. It's giving us access to a new area that, you know, most people don't think too much about, but in with your presentation it allows us to actually think about those nuances and intricate details of the communication and also how then we can support um, future space farers and explorers um uh you know uh, in their well-being to support their well-being so appreciate it thank you uh it's been a thank pleasure you. hopefully you'll come back again soon thank you all right